Welcome to the Pendulum Insight Podcast. This is a show for deal makers in the blockchain business, where we meet the players who are changing the game today and get their insight into everything from the red tape to the raise. This is your host, Colton Moffitt. Let's get started. Everybody. Today, we're joined by the Vice President of Marketing at Polymath, Graham Mort. He is the author also of uh, B is for Bitcoin, which I'll tell you some more about. We're going to have an interesting chat today about Polymath. And Polymath, if you haven't already heard, is a decentralized platform that makes it easy to create security tokens. Security token standard spearheaded by Polymath embeds regulatory requirements into the tokens themselves, restricting trading to authorized participants only. So they're basically tackling the complex technical challenges and in a respect to the kind of regulatory issues that have been going on that you might have heard of. So today, I really am appreciating you stepping in today to talk to us about this. Just tell us a little more about yourself and what Polymath is and how you got started. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thanks for the intro, Colton. Uh, yeah, so uh, we're very, very focused on making it easy for companies to create these things called security tokens. Um, and if anybody is watching this, they're going, I, I don't know what a security token is. It, it's, you can think of it as, as simply a digital financial security that's represented as a token on a blockchain. So what we're enabling is this transition of this world where we're going from the majority of securities that exist being pieces of paper to a world where the securities that exist are completely digital. Right. And so we, we've seen this happening uh, time and time again. Right. We used to have books. Now we have ebooks. We used to send mail. Now we have email. And so what we're looking around is, is saying, why do share certificates still exist? Hmm. A huge number of companies, uh, primarily private companies that exist, their, their securities are completely analog. Right. They live in a filing cabinet somewhere. To us, that's absolutely insane. And so to kind of enable this actual shift to occur where we go to a world of completely digital blockchain based securities, it needs to be easy for companies to create them. And that's kind of where we fit into the picture is taking care of the technological steps of creating one of these security tokens. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. You know, there are a number of different players that are approaching this challenge and it's really early in the game, but uh, Polymath has been kind of stand out just in terms of the amount of media attention, the partnerships that have been announced. What do you think most contributes to Polymath's current level of success? I would say uh, just kind of in terms of the space more broadly, I would say it has to do with the, the market size that we're tackling. I mean, the financial securities market is, is gigantic. It's, it's a couple hundred trillion dollars. Um, and then if you start getting into derivatives, quadrillions of dollars mm. right and so if we can provide the platform that enables people to create these things and we're taking some portion of this market in terms of uh kind of like the creation technology side of things and we, we become kind of the base layer infrastructure stack of how trading uh, works as far as a protocol how storing these tokens works as far as a protocol and all these other functionalities that go into somebody creating a security. So functionalities like dividends, right? How do dividends get paid? Uh, how does on-chain governance work? How, how do things like this work? Uh, and, we're, and if we're kind of the base layer technology of all of this, that's a very, very exciting opportunity. Um, and then in terms of, I guess, Polymath more specifically, uh, I think we have something that works and that people have now been using and that people are really excited about because a lot of the projects you see just in the blockchain space in general, um, mainly just because we're still in the early days of a lot of stuff, a lot of companies are still kind of, here's what we're going to build, mm -hmm. right? But at Polymath, we have built something that works and that people are using. So today, there have been 77 security tokens created through Polymath, right? And so that's 77 uh, securities that did not exist previously on the Ethereum blockchain. And so... Very exciting that we have a product that actually works and that people have started to use. Absolutely. It's been fascinating to watch. I am uh, in your Telegram group and I see just some really interesting conversations happen there, you know, either from people that are just very new to it, trying to understand and they're getting good information or the general reaction to some of these announcements. It's, it's been impressive. So, you know, just personally, how would you like to see the development of tokenized assets play out? within the context of just 2019? 
2019 for me uh, is all about more, um, right? I want to see more things. I want to see more issuance platforms like Polymath. I want to see uh, more companies getting together and talking about what a standard would look like for security tokens. And so that's, that's something that we're working very closely and very intensely on. I want to see more security token exchanges. Uh, right now, there is only one security token exchange that is live, and that's Open Finance Network. Mm -hmm. uh, T0 actually announced last week uh, that they will be going live very shortly, I believe, in the next couple of days. So that's going to be two security token exchanges that will be live. I, I want to see many more security token exchanges. I want to see uh, more companies issuing security tokens, and I want to see more investors that are buying security tokens. Uh, mm -hmm. And I really think that we're kind of at the point now where the ecosystem is maturing. There's a couple of security token exchanges that exist where people can trade these things. Uh, we're, we're working on a standard for these security tokens in terms of how can we standardize all of the functions and all of the code that's across all of these security tokens that allows people to be more comfortable with the technology, really. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's when we start to see more companies issuing tokens, and that's when we see more investors comfortable buying these tokens. And so that, that's kind of what I'm really looking for this year. Great. You know, that makes a lot of sense. The, the idea of people becoming comfortable with it, people who are not necessarily deeply involved in the tech or, you know, the kind of philosophical underpinning of a lot of what happened in the blockchain space, they might have seen some of the negative hype towards the end of, I guess maybe hype's not the right word, but the negative press towards the end of last year with respect to ICOs, with respect to some of the scams that happened and the stats surrounding that. So going into this year with legitimacy and adoption being dependent on building a good reputation, you know, some good PR followed by some like fundamentally good business results for people. So, uh, you know, I'm glad to hear you say that. Now, how, how would you characterize, you know, the benefits and drawbacks of digital issuance, such as an STO as compared to traditional models like an IPO or, you know, to beat the dead horse, the, the ICO crowdfunding model? Uh, yeah, relative to an IPO, I would say is so, so very important, I guess, to first char characterize or categorize. Um, an IPO is a company deciding to go public on a stock exchange, right? So they become a reporting company. Um, maybe they were a reporting company before, but just weren't traded. But so they, they're definitely a reporting company. They have to make certain disclosures every quarter. Um, they have to have their books audited, all, the, all these different kinds of things that they're required to do. Whereas an FPO, uh, you could do a public offering or or a private offering. Um, and what, we, what we're really seeing right now uh, in terms of the security token space is a lot of companies that are doing STOs, so they're creating a security token and, and selling it to investors. Um, a lot of them are going the private route. So, so they generally don't want to be a public reporting company, and that's really where we see the biggest benefit right now with security tokens is because you can program the regulatory compliance into these tokens. So in terms of, let's say, uh, in the U.S., if you have 2,000 or more shareholders, you become a public reporting company. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you can program the regulatory compliance into that security token and, and say, okay, only 1,999 investors are allowed to hold this token, then what you can do is you can open up this kind of liquid secondary market where these tokens that are very easy to trade, very easy to move, very easy to store, these things can actually get traded around amongst 1,999 people and kind of enable a quasi-public secondary market while the company can still remain private. Mm -hmm. And so the huge benefit um, right there is in terms of the efficiency, transparency, and liquidity over doing a security token rather than a piece of paper for a private company. Um, and then the benefit in terms of doing an STO while being a private company relative to doing an IPO, I would say are the costs. Mm -hmm. so, so if you do an IPO um, to get listed on, let's say the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ, that's going to cost, uh, I believe it's about 100000 to $200,000. And then ongoing fees every year are, I, I want to say anywhere between uh, $75,000 and $100,000. $50,000. So that's, that's money that's coming out of your pocket every single year to remain on these exchanges. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, as a public reporting company, you're going to need a CFO. You're going to be making uh, disclosures every single quarter. You're going to be having investor update calls. You're going to be having to do all of these different requirements that come with being a public company. Whereas if you're going to go the private 
STO route, and now it doesn't, you don't necessarily have to be private if you're doing an STO, but that's just kind of what we've seen as, as uh, users. That's primarily what they want to do, right? And so if you're going to go that route, you don't need to be a public reporting company. You don't need to pay a hundred grand to get on a stock exchange. You don't need to pay a hundred grand every year to remain on the stock exchange. Um, but you can still maintain some liquidity for your shares. And so as an early investor, that's more exciting to them, mm. right? As an early investor, if that company is going to stay private, but you just have a piece of paper, it's really hard to sell that. Mm. Right? But if you have a security token that's trading on a liquid secondary exchange, much easier to sell, much easier to find buyers. And, and so that's really where we see uh, kind of the huge benefit. Um, you also asked about ICOs. Um, completely different from ICOs, right? Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people kind of think, okay, the ICO market is drying up. I'll just do an STO instead. It's the same thing. <laughs> and then they kind of call us and they go, oh, hey, I'm going to be regulatory compliant and do an STO. I'm just going to put an Ethereum wallet address on the internet and tell people to contribute to it, not KYC anybody. I'm not going to do anything whatsoever in terms of getting my legal stuff sorted out. I'm not going to worry about incorporating a business. And we're, and we're like, no, you're just doing an ICO, but you're just using a different term, right? And that, that's not what STOs are about. What STOs are about is providing a kind of technological upgrade to the existing legacy financial system, right? So we're digitizing the financial technology stack. Right. Whereas, and so we're kind of taking the technology that was used in ICOs, right? Very seamless capital distribution, automatically fundraise, be able to send tokens very easily um, and be able to store tokens yourself if you want. So you can self custody these financial securities, right? right. But that's kind of where the, that's kind of where the similarities end, yeah. right? Because STOs are completely regulated. You got to do a bunch of legal work. You have to have a legal team. Uh, you might want a broker dealer helping you fundraise. You have to KYC and AML verify every single person who's going to hold your security. Um, and so in terms of, um, there's a lot more differences from ICOs than similarities, I would say. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. There was, um, toward the end of last year, a lot of these kind of articles or panels or whatever that, that pitted the two as, as some sort of competing model. When, you know, I, I wanted to bring up that comparison between the ICO, STO, IPO, because they so often get talked about in the same article. But as you said, it's a totally different approach. And what I found is people who are very um, mentally invested in the ICO model, which again, it has its own, pur its own purposes and its own benefits. It, for them, they say, well, why would anybody want to put money into an STO? They won't have any liquidity versus they would with an ICO. I say, well, like as compared to what? Venture capital, private equity, then there's, then it's much more liquid. You know, if, if they say, well, why would anyone want to deal with KYC or why would, why would somebody want to pay all that money to go and do things in a way that's compliant with old legacy financial systems. Like, well, again, as compared to what? It can be less expensive. It can be more efficient compared to the legacy financial system, as you mentioned. So when you guys approach that and you have some of this misunderstanding, you know, and you're, you're the VP of marketing, so I guess this will be a good question for you. What has been the most important thing? Do you even focus on that discussion or do you simply focus on presenting the kind of fintech benefit angle to the financial industry? Yeah, it's, it's generally more focused on how we can present the benefits to specifically an issuer of financial securities. So mm -hmm. somebody's got a new company or maybe they have an existing company. Uh, they want to go fundraise or, or they just want to kind of digitize uh, their cap table. Right? And so main benefits, there's three. Um, liquidity, right? So you have a piece of paper, shares to figure right now. How easy, how easy is it for you to trade that? It's pretty hard, right? And then once they can communicate that to their investors and say, hey, there's all these benefits with security tokens, why don't I do that, right? And so, so sorry, top three benefits, liquidity, efficiency, transparency. Mm -hmm. And so when you explain that to the founder or CEO of a company, and then they're able to explain that to their potential investors. The way that it's really easy to pitch is, let's say an investor has two options of investing in a company in front of them, in company A and company B. They're identical in every single way. No difference whatsoever. They both make the same products. They both have the same employees. We're in some mysterious universe where they've cloned everybody. Let's say that that's what's going on right now. 
Sure. The only difference between company A and company B is that company A has pieces of paper, has financial securities, and company B has digital security tokens as their financial securities. Which one would you rather invest in? The one that's really hard to trade and the one that sits in a filing cabinet or the one that can be very easy to trade, very easy to store, and trade fees are essentially zero. Capital, the markets are open 24-7, 365. Which one would you rather want, right? And any investor in the right mind would say, I want to go with company B. And, and it's really just a matter of us and all these other players in the security token ecosystem properly communicating this to people and really educating people on here are the main benefits and here's why we really think it's a no-brainer and it's just a matter of time before we kind of move over to this new system. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. You know, I have spent a couple of years helping people buy and sell online businesses and the digital assets that go along with that. And what I found is that there is a good understanding, particularly in the marketing world for online businesses, of building a business to sell. They do get that. But the step further that gets into what you're talking about is building a business that the buyer thinks they can sell, whether it's in whole or in part which that that's like a step further than I think a lot of people actually take that. It's, they're not just wanting to buy a revenue stream. They're wanting to buy something that they can resell later and they can get out of it if they need to, especially if they're buying a portfolio of these things. They don't want to be saddled with something for a long time if it's, uh, if it's not working out. And in the course of technology changing as quickly as it does, there are many models that seem fine and good in 2019 that by 2021 might seem ridiculous and kind of backwater. So, you know, liquidity is important and the ability for people to make those decisions for themselves in a transparent and responsible way. I think that's also very important. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the huge reasons why ICOs were so massive and why they kind of received the amount of hype they did when, I mean, in reality, a lot of the companies weren't even building the things they said they were going to do um, is the liquidity aspect. Mm -hmm. if, I'm a, if I'm a quote investor in an ICO and someone's going to give me a 50% bonus to what the public is receiving and I can dump tokens the second they become available, why would I not take that? Yeah. Right. And so, I mean, liquidity is king. Yeah. And, and really, that's going to be a huge reason why we think security tokens went out in the end. And, and again, not because you can immediately sell security tokens, right? There's still going to be whatever regulatory lockups are associated with any type of offering. But I just mean in the secondary market, there's going to be more liquidity because these private securities are going to be trading on exchanges. Right. And that's really, that's really one of the biggest benefits that we see in that. In that com and the reason why companies are so excited to talk to us about this. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And if you're listening right now and you're not really familiar with the uh, the burden and the difficulty of the private sale of a business, so say you've got a small business, a medium, you know, SME, they're not publicly traded, they don't have any intention of ever doing so, but they're still doing five, ten million dollars a year in revenue. That they could even be a SaaS business that's just not major it's not salesforce it might be hard for you to wrap your head around the amount of businesses are out there staggering that have almost no hope of ever selling for what they think they could they have very limited options for raising capital they're now presented with a new opportunity thanks to this technology so i find that stuff promising you know i'd, I'd say that what you're getting at is key component that people who caught wind of this whole thing because of the ico sort of craze they're just not that familiar with how hard it is for people who have a business that's not publicly traded to actually have any liquidity at all. Yeah. Um, I mean, I completely agree. Um, and I, I would even, I would add on to that and say a lot of people don't realize how large the private securities market is. Uh, a lot of people like they know, they know companies like Salesforce um, and they know Google and Apple and Amazon. They go, Oh, those are the biggest companies ever. And kind of every company, that is real and that exists on earth is publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> um, and then you look at the numbers, um, and so this is, I believe, uh, from numbers from 2017, uh, in terms of Reg D offerings, so these are, these are private companies that are offering a sale of securities, Reg D offerings uh, raised $1.8 trillion. Yeah. Right. And so when everybody was talking about, oh, ICOs are mainstream, ICOs are so big, look at how much money we're raising. We raised, uh, I think, like $7 billion in a year. It's like, right. reg the offerings to $1.8 trillion. It's like, yeah. it's nowhere close. The private securities market is gigantic. 
um, and the security token ecosystem is it's going to, in my opinion, um, that's really where, what it's going to take over first. Um, and then public securities are, are sort of kind of the next aspect once once we eat the entire private securities market. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's I, I hope. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> taking taking the bites then, big bites in 2019. So yeah. to get back to just some of the difficulties that are being addressed. Um, you know, we talked about liquidity. Let's talk about KYC. This has been controversial in the end of 2018. KYC, AML, compliance within the United States, Europe, Asia. How is the tech handling that? And, and what do you think that'll mean from one jurisdiction to the next? Yeah, it's actually being handled in a very cool way. Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to make KYC and AML sexy, but I, <laughs> but I actually, yeah. I think we've done it. I think we have done it. Um, yeah. So all of, all of these security tokens that are being created through Polymath have associated with them uh, what we call a whitelist. Hmm. And so the whitelist, uh, it's, it's a few columns long, and what it has is Ethereum wallet addresses, and then any associated cell lockups for that wallet address, which is just the date, any associated buy lockups associated with that address, which is just the date, um, and then some other information like, is this person accredited, or is this wallet address uh, belong to an accredited person? Uh, if they're a non-accredited uh, person, how much can they invest in the security token and a few and a few other uh, kind of columns uh, related to this. And so what happens is because to hold a financial security, the issuer needs to know who you are as an investor. The investor must go through a KYC process. Mm. Right. And so typically an issuer will use a third party KYC provider with this just because the, the issuer is focused on whatever they do, which is make widgets or run their their SaaS business, whatever the case may be. Right? And so they're going to use a third party KYC provider. And so that third party KYC provider is looking at people's passports. Uh, they're looking at the driver's license, whatever they need to look at They're If if necessary, they're verifying whether or not that investor is an accredited investor. And then what happens is as the investor is going through the KYC process, they're linking their Ethereum wallet address with their identity. Hmm. And then what happens is the KYC provider in conjunction with the issuer creates this whitelist with the Ethereum wallet addresses and then with any other buy lockups, sell lockups, any other restrictions. And then the whitelist can be very easily uploaded uh, through the Polymath Token Studio to be associated with your token. And now only those people that are on the whitelist, only those Ethereum wallet addresses that are on the whitelist are able to hold and trade the security. Hmm. And then further than that, they're only allowed to buy the security if they are able to. They're only allowed to sell the security if they're able to. So for example, two, pe two Ethereum wallet addresses could be on the whitelist, but maybe they have some buy lockup uh, that could be violated today if they try to buy something. And maybe the other one has a sell lockup date that could be violated if they try to sell something today. So they literally cannot trade the, t the security token unless they are authorized to do so by the whitelist in conjunction with what we call a transfer manager. So every single time there is any trade of any security token that's created through Polymath, the token calls what's called the, the transfer manager and it says, hey transfer manager, uh, can this Ethereum wallet address sell tokens today? Transfer manager goes, oh yeah, okay, check. And can this wallet address buy tokens today? And transfer manager goes, okay, yes, check. And then the transfer can be executed. But if both those criteria are not met, then the, fa then the transaction literally fails and it is not possible. And so we're moving from this world where regulatory compliance is handled by a human being saying, hey, you can't make that trade to a world where the code and the technology make sure that things that are not supposed to happen cannot happen. And so we think it's, it's actually a really exciting time uh, to be doing all of this. Absolutely. And to have that kind of compliance and, and regulatory compliance built in from a tech perspective is fascinating because I was just having a chat with a gentleman who was saying that the entire SEC has less than 80 employees or something. And with the current <laughs> government shutdown situation, Maybe it will need to be automated sooner rather than later, right? So I have yeah. a couple questions for you. Just from our blockchain partnerships group, which is on LinkedIn and Telegram, we are oriented around just business development and partnership development within the space. So Alvaro Jimenez Jimenez of Gaudium Capital wanted to know 
specifically, what is the utility of the poly token? Uh, how is it used? Why is it needed? And how do people benefit from holding it? Yeah, so the poly token right now uh, is used to reserve a token symbol. Uh, so when you go through the Polymath Token Studio, uh, we, we have a process where you can reserve a token symbol and then that becomes yours. Hmm. Uh, and and kind of why we need to do that is because if anybody was able to make, uh, let's say, Col Colton, what, what, uh, what token symbol would you want to make for your company? What would it be? Acme? Uh, Goog? Apple, sure, what? sure. We'll go say Acme. No, that make me think of okay, cool. Anvil's coming out of the sky. <laughs> yeah, cool. All right, sounds good. Right, so so once you reserve the Acme token, nobody else can reserve that, and mm -hmm. so it costs 250 poly for you to do that. Uh, it costs two, an additional 250 poly for you to actually create the token, uh, and you can program in any any uh, kind of characteristics that you want that we have on the platform. So things like, do you want your token to be divisible or indivisible? Mm -hmm. uh, do you want there to be transfer restrictions on your token in terms of the maximum number of investors? Earlier we talked about Reg D offerings uh, and being a private company, right? So you'd probably want to program in uh, that there can only be 1,999 shareholders. Mm -hmm. um, and then also to use any of the audited STO smart contracts that we have on the platform. Right now we have two, uh, hopefully more coming soon. Uh, it costs poly to use one of those. Um, okay. So the more basic contract costs 20,000 poly. And then the, the more complex contract, which is actually pegged in USD terms, costs 100,000 poly to use. Okay. So one poly is one US dollar right now? Uh, no, it's not. No. Uh, sorry. So for the offering type, yeah. um, you will designate how much you want one of your tokens to cost, and okay. that will be in US dollar terms. So somebody could send you, uh, let's say, one ETH for your offering, mm -hmm. uh, it's whatever, $120 right now, uh, roughly. Um, yeah. So you're going to receive back the correct number of tokens based on the USD amount that, mm -hmm. that the contract receives, not based on the ETH amount. Gotcha. Thank you for clarifying that. So uh, one question I wanted to get back to before I forget was with regards to KYC, when an individual wants to invest, that's fairly straightforward. A credit investor, okay, they go through the process, passport, whatever. When it's an organization, so it's a fund, you know, someone's offshore LLC or whatever, like what are we looking at? Is this a, you know, a beneficial ownership determination? Is it everybody who has any kind of control, any substantial control, directorship? Uh, what's that process like if it's not an individual? Yeah, I mean, uh, we're, we're definitely getting outside uh, kind of my realm of, <laughs> of, of KYC requirements, right? Because technology is just the tech layer. Yeah. Um, and so the issuers are working directly with their own KYC provider to, to get all this information and to make sure that everything is regulatory compliant. Also working with their own legal team. Gotcha. And so, so a lawyer is going to say, okay, these are the types of investors uh, we're comfortable taking in based on the type of offering you're doing, based on where you're incorporated, based on the amount of disclosures you're trying to do, all, all these different kinds of things. And then the KYC provider is going to know, okay, this is a fund. Okay, these are the things I need. This is what I need to gather. Right? So, so us at Polymath, we're not really involved in that process. Um, all, all that really Polymath comes into play there is when the KYC provider and the issuer when they, when they upload that whitelist, now we've built a series of smart contracts that allow that whitelist to easily be converted into code, thrown on the Ethereum blockchain, attached to that security token to prevent transfers from, from taking place that aren't supposed to take place. Gotcha, gotcha. So that's cool. I mean, that's definitely good to say, you know, very focused on exactly what you guys can do and help in that regard. And so if you're listening to this and you're thinking, you're in a position just financially, legally, and you've got that stuff in place and you know who you're going to work with and you can work with your KYC provider and Polymath is going to be able to facilitate from a tech perspective, the use of that whitelist and, and rolling that out through the security token. Correct. So, and, and I'll just, I'll, I'll add one more point on that. Um, sure. So if you have your own KYC provider, that's great. Um, bring them, bring them, while you're working with them and then just at the end of the process, you just need to make sure that you have that, uh, that CSV file with all that necessary information. But, but if you don't have a KYC provider and a lot of companies, you know, maybe they're doing this for the first time, maybe they're selling securities for the first time. Uh, they don't work with a legal team right now. Maybe they don't know any broker dealers. What we've done on the platform as you're walking through and creating your security token, we've provided one section of, of the polymath token studio where we say, Hey, do you not have a legal team? Okay, well, here are five that we recommend and you can apply to work with them and they're going to receive an email right now 
and see your company information that you want to send them and then they can reach out to you and you guys can start working together. Do you not have a KYC provider? Okay, well here are a couple that we recommend. Uh, you can apply to work with them and they'll reach out to you and you guys can start working together. So, so we understand that and a lot of people are, are new to this process and maybe, maybe they don't know all of the parties that they need for a successful security token offering. And so we wanna make it easy for these issuers that are going to be creating financial securities to, to be connected with any of these third parties they might need. But, but again, of course, they can bring their own and we're totally fine with that. Doesn't matter to us. Yeah, well, that's actually really cool. I mean, I didn't uh, realize that that was uh, so well integrated into the process. And this is probably a strange comparison, but what comes to mind is maybe back in the 70s or 80s, right? Booking international travel would have been an undertaking. You got to go to a travel agent or it would just be ridiculous. Now you can go to Skyscanner or Expedia or whoever you prefer and just click through. This all the things I want. Got my flights, hotels, insurance, uh, travel advisories. You know, someone will come get me in a helicopter if the whole world's going to hell. You know? <laughs> so that can all be done from a web form. So that's very interesting. Um, Ben Leff of Leff Ventures, uh, we worked together, we're putting together this opportunity exchange and he wanted to know with all the strategic partnerships you've made, um, he, he wants to know more about what those partnerships have done to help Polymath grow your business and were all of them effective and mutually beneficial? Uh, why or why not? Yeah, I, I think uh, the biggest point to note is that, is that we absolutely want to grow this ecosystem that we have, this marketplace of all these different advisors on the platform. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, I mean, to date, every single one we've made has been mutually beneficial, right? Because an issuer comes to the platform and they go, oh yeah, well, wait, what do I have to do with legal again? Okay, does Polymath help with my legal? And then, then we go, no, here are five amazing firms that we're aware of and you can begin working with them very shortly, right? So just reach out to them and you can work with them. And so what, what all these partnerships are allowing us to do is kind of one bringing credibility to ourselves and these other firms right we're we're saying yes we're working together you know we're not fighting each other we're not we're playing nicely in the sandbox with all <laughs> these other companies yeah. and and so they're bringing us credibility we're giving them credibility and we're making it easier for the end user and, and that's what it's all about we don't necessarily we don't want to take every single piece of the security token offering puzzle. What we want to focus on is the technology layer and we rely on these third party service providers. And so we want to be nice to them and they want to be nice to us. So, so as far as uh, to date, every partnership we've made has been definitely mutually beneficial. Um, and then additionally, I would say our relationships with uh, security token exchanges uh, have been very mutually beneficial as well. Um, and so I'll talk about that a, a tiny bit. Uh, open finance right now. Uh, I believe I've, spoke about them earlier. They're the only security token exchange that's live uh, today and trading security tokens and T0 will be live, I believe, in about a week's time. And mm -hmm. so Open Finance has uh, publicly announced that they are going to be using the Polymath standard. Uh, so right now, what we're calling it is the ST20 standard. That's what we've been creating the security tokens as. We want to standardize the process and the protocol of how transfer restrictions take place how dividend payments take place, all these other things that relate to security tokens and open finance. I said, yes, we like the standard that Polymath is, is using. And they've also been a contributor that's announced their support for ERC-1400. Mm. So ERC-1400, you can think of it as the formalization of ST20 that we've been working on, formalized as an ERC, so an Ethereum improvement proposal, and now an Ethereum request for comment. So something that will hopefully be merged into the actual Ethereum code coming up soon. Mm -hmm. And so the reason why that's so important uh, to be working with these exchanges and to be having good relationships with these exchanges is what happens if somebody creates a security token through Polymath and then there's no liquidity on the back end. Mm -hmm. The whole thing is pointless, right? And what happens if open finance has no security tokens to trade, right? Well, then what's the point? And so working nicely with, uh, the place where you create security tokens, as well as the protocol that kind of governs all these things, as well as these centralized exchanges that are now popping up and very soon decentralized exchanges that are popping up. Ensuring that there's kind of a common standardized language in terms of the technology among all of these players makes a huge difference in terms of comfortability and confidence in issuers uh, using this technology and in investors using this technology. 
Sure. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I appreciate you explaining that. And so I want to get back to one thing you mentioned, which is the security token standard. Uh, you'd launched a website along with you know, a pretty wide array of partners. So if you could just go back into the story and the motivation behind that, um, you know, I got the gist of it, but just to summarize it for everybody who's listening, because I believe it's a security token security token standard.org. Um, so yeah, just tell us more. Yes. About it's, uh, yes. The security token standard.org. Great. Uh, best way to explain this. Uh, people think that Ethereum is what launched the ICO boom and people are like, Oh yeah, Ethereum was created. And then five minutes later, all these ICOs started popping up, but, but that's not really what happened. Uh, the thing that really created the boom was ERC 20. And so ERC-20 is a standardized methodology with six functions that standardizes the means by which you can create a token on top of Ethereum. And so once there was this standardized way that, some, that a developer could create a token, it became incredibly easy to do so. And as we found out, very worthwhile for people to do so. And so creating this standardized way that things can function in technology is massive. And you can talk to pretty much any technologist, they will completely agree. Once all these developers know that they're working on the same thing and that some developer is not going to bring in a random piece of something else and some developer is going to bring, bring in a random piece of something else, it's so much easier to do everything if you're speaking the exact same language in terms of standardization. And so what we've recognized at Polymath is, okay, ERC-20 worked great for utility tokens, right? No restrictions whatsoever in ERC-20. There is no talk whatsoever. There is no function at all that deals with transfer restrictions with ERC-20. And so what we said is if we want to actually make this security token revolution a real thing, we need to create the standard for security tokens. And so ERC-1400 is the embodiment of that. And the way to, the way to think about ERC-1400 is, is it's an extension of ERC-20 with additional functionalities. So it's backwards compatible with ERC-20, which is amazing. So you don't need any specialized kind of wallet to hold security tokens. You don't, you don't need any new special infrastructure to be built to hold these tokens, which is, which is great, right? So if you have a wallet that can hold the ERC-20 tokens, which most people do, right? Um, use MetaMask, MyEther wallet, any of these other things. Right. Um, you can now hold security tokens in your wallet. Um, and so we wanted to make it incredibly interoperable because that's what people really wanted. But we needed to make that standard in terms of how to transfer restrictions work and all these other securities functionalities work on Ethereum. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That sounds like a very worthwhile endeavor. And it's uh, just to clarify, if you're listening and you're not able to see the screen or any of that, it's the security token standard.org. Is that yes, correct? Nailed okay. it. Yep. Perfect. And you can actually, you can see there uh, at the bottom of, of that website, uh, you can see all the companies that have expressed their support. Uh, so companies like Perkins Coie, which is one of the largest law firms in the security token space, Open Finance, the only functioning security token exchange right now, uh, Identity Mind, NetKey, which are KYC providers, and actually Securitize uh, has supported ERC-1400. And people that are very familiar with the space might go, well, Securitize is your competitor. Why would they be supporting that, right? But it's we all want to work together. We all want to play nicely together because uh, kind of in my mind, if security tokens wins, mm -hmm. then everybody wins, you know? Yeah. So, so we really are very focused on interoperability uh, and making sure that the things we are creating actually benefit end users. And it's really not so much about, Oh no, this is my standard. You know, no, this is your standard, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's creating a standard for the whole entire industry that everybody's comfortable with. And that's going to compel people to use it. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And you can see the benefits of that in all kinds of technology. You know, the people that are listening to this are fundamentally fairly technology aware, you know, it's a business development, partnership development, you know, kind of deal making oriented crowd, but nobody's involved in this space. It's completely illiterate to this stuff. So, um, Speaking of partnerships, why don't you tell us about Solidified and what that partnership means for people who are considering using Polymath to create a security token? Yes, uh, Solidified is, is, is a huge uh, kind of win for us. Um, so Solidified is our official audit partner. So anytime we deploy any code, anything, literally one line of code, anything, anytime we deploy something to Ethereum mainnet, it must go through a third-party auditing service. Mm. Uh, and so 
of course, best practice uh, to have peer review in, inside your company before you deploy everything, but then we go a level beyond that uh, by auditing anything with a third party whose job it is, is to kind of tell you why you suck and tell you why all these things are broken and tell you why you're going to get hacked and to try to save you from that. And yeah. so we do that at any single time we deploy something to Ethereum mainnet. And so Solidified is a, is a big player in the space. Uh, and, and we're just very fortunate that we can work so closely with them because security on Ethereum, when you're using any kind of smart contract, any kind of Solidity code is absolutely paramount. Mm -hmm. right, so what, what happens if somebody raises a hundred million dollars and it gets locked up? <laughs> you know, like, like that's, that's the absolute worst case scenario. Nobody can have that happen. And, and we are so committed um, to working with third party auditing services that make sure that every single thing we ever deploy is, is properly vetted by experts in the industry. That's really great news. I think that in many, many facets of just information technology as a broad industrial category, the message to pay attention to risk management, to information security, just all the warnings that they've been screaming for decades, it was far too late. And fortunately, you know, key players like, uh, like Polymath are actually heeding that from the outset. Yeah. No, um, nobody, nobody wants the headline. <laughs> One's locked up, right? And so, so we're very committed to, to working with people whose job it is is to rip apart your code, right? Yeah. And so, so that's just why it, it matters a lot to us, and it should matter to everybody who's doing anything in the blockchain space. Absolutely, yeah. You know, I think that the the kind of um, negative PR situation from last year, at the tail end of last year, of course, is going to be remedied by measures like this. You know, this partnership you have with Solidified the uh, companies out there. I, I interviewed the guys from, or Dr. Hubert Ritzdorf from Chain Security earlier on, and what they've done with Ethereum in general. It's very cool. It's very important to see this stuff happening and cleaning up some of the image of the scams and the hype and all of that, so that the rest of the world will take what we're doing seriously. Um, in terms of partnership development in general. What do you find most concerning? And everything's been positive so far, but you know, how do you approach due diligence to make sure that nothing slips under the radar and that you're able to keep that positive uh, PR going that you've already got? Yeah, I mean, we do conduct a fair amount of due diligence kind of anytime uh, we're speaking with anybody and looking at associating our names with them. Mm -hmm. um, so right? Like there's lawyers that are on the platform. We want to make sure that a, an issuer that's going through that process, that they're reaching out to somebody uh, who's one real, because a lot of people in the blockchain world are not real. Um, but obviously much more than that uh, has a great reputation and has a great track record. Hmm. And so that's, that's really what we look for is reputation. How do people in the community feel about them? How do their previous business partner, business partners feel about them? How do any of their clients, how do they all feel about them? And, and also kind of what have they done in the past that leads us to believe that it's going to be a good fit for us. Mm -hmm. Like anybody can kind of uh, come out one day and say, oh yeah, hey, we're a great company. Like, look, here's our website. Uh, it looks good. Um, work with us, right? But that's not really enough for us whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, and so very focused on track records uh, and looking at people's reputations in the space. And then, and then ultimately, uh, having a lot of calls with people, uh, having a lot of in-person meetings, nothing can really uh, replace an in-person meeting with somebody kind of to see what vibe you get from them um, and kind of just to, to sort of make sure that you're actually making the right decision in terms of associating your brand with somebody else's. Absolutely. It is such a, a key and crucial thing that I think got overlooked and a lot of companies said they did it and we've seen estimates upwards of 85 or 90 percent of icos being claimed to be scams i don't know how accurate that is but i at least know they were disappointing so we what we do uh in terms of my background you know, i was a private investigator i worked in kind of an open source intelligence capacity and what i've found is that so often the people who are squeaky clean are the most concerning ones because there's always something right and it's better if they can be honest and like you said you get in person with them and just get a sense for if they're even being honest. And consistency is really the giveaway. Yeah, hundred percent. So, what kind of partnerships do you see being most valuable for Polymath and your clients in 2019? You know, it's gone so well so far. So, 
what would be an ideal way to build on that? Like you said, more, more in 2019. So specifically, what do you think would be most helpful? Uh, I would say broker dealers. Uh, yeah. that, that's who we're very much targeting right now. Uh, because I think a lot of what happened uh, kind of in, in 2018, uh, even end of 2017, is everybody got excited about ICOs. And then they went, oh, okay, never mind. Um, this seems kind of uh, like not the best route for my company. I want to be able to sleep at night. I don't want the SEC knocking on my door at 4 a.m. Right. Um, I'm going to do an FTO. And I'm just going to go raise $50 million and I raise it in four minutes because I just put an Ethereum wallet address somewhere and I automatically get $50 million because everybody's getting $50 million. Right. right. And then you turn around and you go, Oh yeah, I'm selling equity in my startup. And I go, sorry, you want what valuation for your company? Right. No, you cannot raise $50 million at this stage of the game. Um, and so what we're really excited about is broker dealers that are, that are kind of bringing, these companies' expectations back to earth and then helping them fulfill those realistic expectations. Um, so somebody raising, ra raising money for a startup, they generally need help, right? So they want a broker dealer who can go help them fundraise and who has the licenses to do so. Um, and because Polymath provides that platform to easily create a security token and then uh, use one of our audited STO smart contracts, we want companies to fundraise large amounts. Mm -hmm. uh, and the easiest way for a company to fundraise large amounts is with an, an expert professional broker dealer. And mm -hmm. so we're very focused on speaking with these broker dealers, getting them added to the platform and making it very, very simple for these companies to reach out to them in order to receive the help that they want. Because a lot of companies, you know, they have a great business idea. Uh, they can easily do the legal work. Any lawyer, um, not any lawyer, um, but, but a good lawyer can do the security <laughs> legal work for you. Um, and a good KYC provider can can uh, do a good job on the KYC end. A good custody uh, agent can provide excellent custody of your funds. Um, but but really, that, that broker dealer that can help you raise a million dollars, that can help you raise five million dollars, that can help you raise ten million dollars. Really, that's where we see kind of the the snowball start to pick up uh, speed and start to pick up size in the security token world. Is when you start seeing this company raise five million bucks. This company raised 10 million bucks. That, that to me is when kind of the eyeballs start looking at the security token space as a very, very legitimate way to raise funds uh, that's more efficient, transparent, and liquid. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And they're going to be able to, you know, work with people who are really experienced and have developed networks already versus what happened with just the ICO stuff in the past uh, year and a half was a lot of, um, kind of just run of the mill digital marketing, not to slight people that were involved in marketing ICOs. I mean, it's, it was really great marketing, but that's a totally different ball game. So it's good to have those relationships. If you are a broker dealer and you're listening or you're connected with people who are definitely go check out Polymass website and, you know, get a sense of how the technology might work with what you do. You know, think back on what we've discussed so far today and, and think about what you could do in terms of volume of transactions, efficiency, um, and, and what that could mean for your business in the next couple of years. So for those listeners who are looking for voices and insight they can trust, I like to ask our guests if there's anyone in the blockchain space that you hold in such high regard that you'd recommend them without hesitation. Without hesitation, Andreas Antonopoulos. Uh, yeah, I think, <laughs> I think, I think he is just the absolute best guy. Um, and, and not, not only is he an amazing speaker, I mean, I, I don't think he has notes and he'll go up on stage for an hour 30, not yeah. stutter once. I mean, he has everything completely dialed in. Uh, I, I think his integrity is something that everyone should aspire to. Yeah. Um, like when you hear him talk and when you see him interact on Twitter, as, as soon as someone says something offside, he, he cuts it off, mm -hmm. right? It is, it is no, that is not what I'm about. That is not for me, right? I'm here to educate people on what's happening. Um, I, I just think, he, I, th I think he's the best guy. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, th he was really one of the first voices that got me excited about Bitcoin uh, and then about blockchain technology subsequently. And, and I just think uh, everybody could have something that they can learn from Andreas. And, and I just think he's a, he's a great guy. Yeah. Fascinating content. Incredibly articulate guy. I think um, there were times over the past 
five years or so when I just didn't pay attention to this space much. And then, you know, I thought, oh man, now look at all this hype, what's going on. And then I would see one of his videos, I'm like, yes, this makes sense. This is still worthwhile. Yeah. I'm, I'm so glad that this is still happening. Um, so yeah, go check out Andreas Antonopoulos. You'll know you found the right guy because of that super, super slick logo that's kind of uh, hinting at his own hairline. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> super recognizable guy. Um, probably one of the most articulate speakers in this space. And I, I don't know. I don't know anyone who explains what's going on better than him. I don't yeah. know a single person. Yeah. And he, he actually just um, recently kind of started getting into the Ethereum stuff more too. So yeah, we, we won't go down that rabbit hole too much, but do go look him up on YouTube and set yourself a couple hours aside to, to wrap your head around what that man has to say, if you haven't already. Um, yeah. So one of my favorite parts of the show is to ask you about your favorite deal story. So this could be, you know, a negotiation outcome, serendipity, something that stands out in your mind and offers a valuable lesson. Yeah, I would say um, we talk about, uh, so recently uh, we were at the North American Bitcoin conference hmm. and uh, up to, let's say, let's say about two weeks before uh, we started talking to a crowdfunding platform. Um, and so they, they have companies so similar to Kickstarter, Indiegogo, um, mm -hmm. a company like that. And what they're looking for is a white label solution, uh, for tokenization, right? So we still want to have our logos on everything, but we don't want to go build our own tokenization platform. So can Polymath provide something that can sort of plug in as being the back end of, of our technology? Um, and so we're thinking. That's a, that's a pretty interesting idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's think about it. Um, and so then we actually kind of uh, just happened to run into them at the North American Bitcoin conference, gave them a demo of the platform and they seem very excited uh, mm. about what we have to offer. Um, and so I guess I kind of like the advice uh, uh, on that is go meet people, Yeah. right? Seeing somebody in person, shaking their hand, talking to them, having a laugh about something, and showing them what you can actually provide in a very easy to understand and easy to digest way is, is more invaluable than, than a hundred phone calls and, and kind of a million webinars if you want, right? Like showing them in person, here's what we can do. Here are the benefits. And this is kind of how easy it is to get started. I, I think that's the most important thing that anyone can do. Excellent. Go get the FaceTime, go out there, go to the conferences. Um, you know, definitely, take take his advice and you know i would really appreciate you sharing that with us it's definitely something that we want to focus on you know this kind of activity there's a lot of resources out there for people that are focused on trading or investing or the tech but you know these sorts of stories and this information is very valuable and uh, kind of lacking in this space so do you have any final words of wisdom you'd like to share with everyone who's listening right now get involved in the world of blockchain if you are not already. Yeah. <laughs> um, like I, uh, like I, I, I found out and I, and I mean like really found out uh, kind of about Bitcoin uh, mm -hmm. sort of end of 2014. Um, and I think it was because I left my job in finance and, and finally gave myself permission to learn about this weird thing that people were talking about. Uh, cause, cause Warren Buffett said it was stupid. Right? And Warren Buffett, well, Warren Buffett was my guy. And I said, all right, well, if Warren Buffett says it's stupid, then, then I'm not going to pay any attention to it. And I, left <laughs> finance. I, I think I saw an Andreas Antonopoulos video. I think I saw Mark Andreessen uh, mm -hmm. talking about this. I think I saw Chamath Palihapitiya talking about this. And I said, oh, wow, this is actually a real thing. But I mean, my first, my first real job, or at least where I was um, really kind of contributing in a meaningful way to a meaningful project was Polymath, which was uh, in September of 2017. And so there's two years there where, where I was just kind of thinking about it, you know, I'm going, Oh yeah, it's, it's kind of cool. Like, I mean, I know it's going to change the world. I know it's going to do a whole bunch of stuff, but, but I still didn't really kind of dive in head first in terms of contributing all my time. Right? Like I had other jobs. I, I was comfortable with those. And I said, yeah, you know what? I mean, I'll just buy some Bitcoin. I'll buy some Ethereum. And then, you know, whatever, I'll be a billionaire in, in two or three years. And then uh, that's how I'm going to contribute to the space. But, right. but, really, but really working and helping further along this kind of goal that we all have of seeing this better functioning financial system and, and even just all these other systems as well that, that blockchain technology and Bitcoin can touch, right? Like 
it, it's so rewarding um, kind of being involved in the early days. And, and I bet people are thinking, oh, yeah, it's not early days anymore. But no, we're still very, very early uh, of all of yeah. these things, right? Like the essentially modern internet was, was around in the 60s, yeah. right? but it didn't really have any crazy meaningful mainstream adoption until let, let's even say the 2000s, right? So that's 40 right. years, right? And we're now 10 years, 10 years and, and a couple of weeks into the world of Bitcoin and blockchain. And I think we still have so many amazing things to be built and, and there's so many people that that can still contribute in such a meaningful way to the beginning of this technology. Absolutely. I really appreciate that. And the perspective on it is, is helpful because I was in a similar boat, you know, 2013, 2014, becoming aware, not really getting all that involved though, you know, use it. I, I tried it out. I bought some stuff, whatever. It was fine, but didn't really sink my teeth in until relatively recently. And I mean, I'm glad that so much information is out there now. And as you were saying, you know, if you're listening to this right now, what he just said is so important get involved because the fastest way to learn is to get involved, go meet people in person, connect with people online like this. You know, you don't have to have a podcast. You can just connect with them and talk. So on that note, where can our listeners connect with you if they're interested in learning more about polymath? Uh, yeah, so Polymath specifically, uh, polymath.network, and then we're on most social media platforms, so uh, Reddit, Twitter, Telegram, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, it's usually slash Polymath Network, so twitter.com slash Polymath Network, reddit.com slash r slash Polymath Network, and then myself, uh, if you want to reach out to me, uh, hit me up on Twitter, it's uh, Moore Grams, it's, uh, mm -hmm. my old rap name, oh, yeah. uh, so <laughs> twitter.com slash uh, Moore, my last name, so M-O-O-R-E, Graham, G-R-A-M-F. Okay, great. All right, so it's, it's Moore Graham's, guys. And uh, Graham yeah. Moore, Polymath, uh, and that's polymath.network, guys, not polymath.com. So Yes, if you go to polymath.com, you will, you will find, uh, I think it's uh, like, a, like a nutritionist or something. She will not give us the domain name. We're, we're trying, we're trying. We, we will hopefully be successful at some point, but for now, we are at polymath.network. Oh boy. Well, you know, you can get yourself healthy and get yourself some proper guidance and some help. <laughs> Polymath.network yeah. network guys. Thank you yeah. so much, Graham. It has been, you know, a real pleasure having you and we'll talk to you soon. Awesome. Thanks Holden. Thank you for listening to the pendulum insight podcast. If you learned something today and you want to know more, go check out PendulumInsight.com.